Welcome to the Morning Prep Podcast. We got a minute because the kids haven't started to line up yet. So as I was thinking about that introduction, I realized that in our current time of COVID, it doesn't 100% make sense, especially if you are teaching remotely. Um, However, I know that most of the country still is teaching in person. So it kind of applies to one extent or another. Um, I mean, maybe I could adapt it to say, hey, uh, we've got a minute because the kids haven't entered the Zoom waiting room yet. But that's neither here nor there. So rolling on. So this week's drink, uh, what I'm drinking right now is the Harney and Sons London Tower Blend. It comes in a nice little purple tin. It's this really fancy tea that my wife likes and I like to kind of take advantage of and, and, and drink quite a bit of it because it is delicious. It is a black tea blend with some very naturally sweet, almost floral notes to it but it doesn't become like it doesn't become overwhelming like floral things tend to become overwhelming so it just makes it a very good balanced tea at least in my opinion and i think it's just a great tea for releasing a bit of that stress before the first period bell rings honestly um it truly is delicious it is one of my favorites for sure so in Keeping in true form with a lot of this podcast and a little bit of just who I am and just being completely authentic, um, I am a massive nerd. Um, I absolutely love The Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings is like one of my favorite uh, book series. It's one of my favorite movie trilogies of all time. However, I do, ha- I really have developed this deep love of Star Trek recently. And honestly, my favorite Star Trek series happens to be Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Um, of all the ones, of all the series that I've watched, uh, of all of the Star Trek films that I've seen, of, of just like everything in the Star Trek universe that I've consumed, Deep Space Nine happens to be my favorite And I think when when I think about Deep Space Nine and I really try to analyze why do I love it so much, I mean, there's aspects to it such as the overall storyline and the whole Dominion War uh, story arc that I think is phenomenal. I like the location and a lot of the characters, but I think there's one character that really sticks out to me, and that character is Captain Benjamin Sisko. I absolutely love who he is. I think for me, he blends the aspects of the the just the intelligence of Picard, but with that bit of um, rough edge that Janeway has in Voyager. And I think he's, again, just like this perfect blend between them two. And so I, I think and he's also just a very charismatic of a person. Like he's one of those ones that like when he's on screen, he commands the screen. And I, I think what I appreciate most about him is his work with his team, with his, uh, I guess it's technically not bridge crew, but at least with his uh, upper leadership, with his officers. I think it's um it's really... It's really a, a sight to marvel. Like obviously, it, it, it's all science fiction. It's all a story that's made up, and the writers develop these situations and circumstances. But I think there's a lot to be learned and a lot to glean from the way that Cisco approaches relationships. Because what he does is he takes a very diverse team and, and he molds them into one with a unified vision and a unified goal and a unified purpose. Like if you look at it, like he has a couple of people who are from Starfleet. One of them is a super cocky and arrogant. Uh, doctor that's Bashir um, he also has a former leader of a terrorist or a resistance organization depending upon your perspective um, which is uh, Kira and then he also has a security officer who worked on both sides of a war twice and which is which is Odo and it's all one of those things like from very different perspectives, very different systems of belief, very different cultures. And he helps bring them and mold them into one real clear way of doing things. And it's not so much that he buys them into the Starfleet way of doing things, but he buys them into into his way of doing things. And so when I think about this a little bit deeper, I, I, I it begs a question of like, well, what does this have to do with your classroom? And then of course, like how did he also bridge all of these gaps to create a strong functioning unit? So what we're going to do is I, I really want to address this, 
this classroom question just very briefly right now. It's like, I want you to begin to really see your classroom as a team. So abandon the concept of instructor and student focus and think of it more as like a leader in your team or, or if we're running with a Star Trek analogy, you, you're the captain and that's your bridge crew. Um, think about it in that context because the truth be told in this is that your kids are your team because you all are working towards the same end you are working towards creating the best possible outcomes for your students the kids they're working again to produce the best possible outcome every kid may not admit that but truly every kid wants to succeed and you want to see them succeed too so good leaders always teach and so as you lead them, teach them. So in this week's episode, we're we're focusing in on building strong relationships. So what Cisco did well is that he built the relationships with the team. He built with him each individual member of the team, and then he built the relationships with the team as a whole. He got them to see past their differences and to work towards a common goal. And in Deep Space Nine, it was the security of the space station, Deep Space Nine. And so it's like you need to really focus on building relationships with your kids. The benefits of building relationships with them are many. And like we talked about in the empathy episode, winning your students leads to more classroom buy-in and more growth. The kids are what carry the relationship, forgive me, is what carries your kids through the most difficult times of the year. Honestly, you're going to be able to ask more of them. You're going to be able to expect more of them. You're going to be able to see the best that they can simply because if they trust you, if they believe in your ability to lead and teach them, they are going to fight harder for you. Okay. So the key thing to think about now is how. We've already explored kind of what we're talking about, a brief analogy to work with it and why it's important. But what we need to really explore now is how we do that. So the very first step, we actually started the groundwork last time, is with empathy. You want to be empathetic with your students. You want to feel what they feel. You want them to to more or less know or see that that you're there with them, that you understand, and that you you want to help and support them in that regard. And we discussed some of the ways to do that before. It's like building time into your class to allow the students to more or less feel their emotions and be able to talk them through those those kinds of things. And then, of course, listen to them very authentically and really not not looking just to respond, but actually looking to hear what they have to say and really hear them out and taking a genuine interest in who they are and what they like. like. All those are aspects of just building empathy. So, I mean, again, we covered enough of that last episode. And again, you can always go back to that episode and, and check, that, check out those tips again. Um, so after empathy really comes authenticity. And this is a piece that I've seen countless teachers struggle with. It's something that I, I've struggled with every now and again. And the truth is, like, it's just about being real. It's about being who you are. It's like, so don't put on a fake persona because because you think like that's what they'll like and that's what they'll appreciate Mm -mm. because the kids see right through that. Kids are, I, I don't think enough teachers give enough students credit. I don't think adults in general give give students, give children, give adolescents, give teenagers enough credit for really how intelligent and they are and how easily they pick up on the little nuances they, they can see right through somebody who's being fake i mean they may uh, adults may be able to deceive and trick other adults but but teenagers and, and and adolescents can see right through it and so what's really important for you is that you need to be you you need to be your authentic self. You need to almost to a certain extent lean into that, lean into who you are, because then what's going to happen is that kids are going to be able to see that. And this is going to connect with a point later related to consistency, but they're going to see that when you are you through and through, they're going to respect you more in that regard. 
It's honestly, it's just, it's about being uniquely you while respecting who the students are and taking a genuine interest in them. So you can be a massive Star Trek nerd and your kids can have zero care or com- or compassion or anything like that for Star Trek or sci-fi or anything like that. But what's going to endear them to you in that regard is the fact that you are so unabashed in your love of those things and your desire to share that with them. Because the truth is it, it leads to some measure of reciprocity. They're going to see how much you care about that. And then they're going to want to try to do the same thing for you. They're going to show what they care about and what they love. And they're going to want to share that with you as well. Because again, they're going to see you're not being fake. You're not putting up a front. You're being the real you in the end. And so along with being empathetic and taking a genuine interest in them, it's again, being genuinely yourself. And this piece goes along very tightly with this third point of just respect. The easiest way, the absolute easiest way to mess up is to be disrespectful to a student. All right. And the thing is, is that it requires a lot of time for you to be self-reflective. You need to think very critically and very metacognitively about how you think and how you act towards and with your students. Because what I've seen is that your culture is almost always going to be different from your students. It's not, and I'm not just simply talking about in terms of race and background, but I'm also simply talking about age too. I mean, how old you are, the your own your own age, like a gap of 10 years, a, a generational gap is more than enough for two cultures to be different. The expectations and the norms of even what what I grew up being taught was like was the expected thing to do is different from from students that I've interacted with that had a very similar upbringing to me. So it's like, again, your culture is going to be different. What you value is going to be different. But what's really important for you is to be cognizant of the culture of your students and do not denigrate or disrespect their culture. Okay, this is where asking a lot of questions becomes really important. Like you don't want to pass judgment on the things that your kids say or do. You want to ask questions. You again, going back to showing genuine interest in being authentic and being real is that you want to ask your kids questions. If there's something that they did that you just legitimately don't understand, ask them about it. Honestly, like they may think you're a little bit foolish, a little bit weird, like, oh, how do you not know this? But it always goes back to that element of of culture. It's like, what have you experienced? What do you know that they don't know? And what do they know that you don't know? So a very simple example of something that I've witnessed in just my own career is when working with African-American students from most communities, there is a cultural norm to have some sort of dialogue with the speaker, like akin to something of like a call and respond. Like if you think about if you think about African-American churches where the preacher will just call and like expect the congregation to respond with like amen or praise the Lord or, or something to that extent, like it, it's a very cultural norm, even even for for many African-American communities that may not even go to church. Like it is still it's still expected it's something that's, that's ingrained in in society. Um And so before early in my teaching career, like I took offense when students would just call out when they wouldn't like, quote, like follow the rules of my room. But what I quickly discovered is that some of the rules of my own classroom were not being responsive to the cultural norms of my students. More or less, I was trying to take my culture and I was trying to make my culture the rules of my classroom. And I did not allow my students that opportunity to express themselves. This is where I took some heat from my kids whenever they would say I would never listen to them. It's simply because I never gave them an opportunity to, again, express themselves in a way that is really culturally relevant to them. And I expected them more or less to drop all aspects of their culture and adopt my culture when they stepped into my room. Again, that that is massively disrespectful. And I didn't even know I was doing this. Now, most of my students wouldn't say, like, you were very disrespectful and rude. But it was one of those, like, like subtleties. It's one of those things that it was just kind of in the back of their minds of like, hey, like this isn't right. This doesn't seem quite right. And so this really just falls on like what may be disrespectful to you may not be disrespectful to your kids and vice versa. 
It is a very fine line that you need to walk. But the truth is you need to remember that your story growing up is probably different from your kids. So just simply be aware before you pass any judgments. And again, truly, truly try to learn when in doubt, ask. That's where again, authenticity, being very genuine, ask those questions. Be curious. Again, kids want to talk. Kids love talking about themselves. So at any opportunity you can give them the chance to talk about themselves, they will. Moving on, consistency. This is like, it, at, at one of my first schools, this was like almost a joke, like being consistently inconsistent. Like consistency was the key. Consistency is what we have to do and, and all sorts of other stuff. Like every time there was like a, a meeting with like administration and the teachers, it was again, always this big old joke of just like consistency. You just need to be consistent. <laughs> we would, we would count how many times we would have that conversation. Um, but the truth be told, it is arguably one of the most important things. It is the easiest thing to do, but the hardest thing to master. Deep down, every single child desires clear and consistent structures. They want predictability. They want to know what to expect in every moment. And they honestly want to know that you are going to follow through on what you say. Again, consistency is key. It is the easiest thing to do, the hardest thing to master. Your relationships can hinge on this. Like in any relationship, honestly, if you say you are going to do it, do it. Now, this is easy. It's like, of course, I'll have my classroom rules. I'll, I'll have these procedures. I'll have them follow through. We'll practice them and, and blah, 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 blah. Like it's easy to be consistent in those ways. Where this gets really tricky is in the area of classroom consequences. Because students are going to test you. Many of you know this. Many of you may not have even recognized that it's happening. But students are going to test you on your consistency. They're going to see, do you mean what you say when you say you're going to do it? Especially when it comes to issuing consequences. They are going to wait for your favorite student to do something wrong. Now, be completely honest. You have a favorite student. There's no hiding that. And the truth is, is that if you're really, really honest with yourself, your kids know who your favorite student is. They'll all, I, I used to always play games with my students. I used to always say, it's like, oh, my favorite student is actually in third period. And third period was my prep period. Like they thought that was a hilarious joke. Many of them spent like half the year trying to figure out like who it was. And it, it, again, it took like half the year for them to realize like, oh, I don't actually have any class. It was, a, it was a good joke, but like, truth be told, like kids more or less have a good idea of where they rate in, in your own mind. The, again, they see it. Kids are smart. They pick up on the nuances. They pick up on the way that you talk and the way that you interact with every single kid. They see it and they know it. So be aware of that. And so they are going to watch for when your favorite student messes up. And they're going to look for your reaction. They're going to look. Did you gloss it over? Did you pretend you didn't see it? Did you give them a lesser consequence than you would have done for somebody else? Say, say the kid who is always getting sent out of the room or always getting parent phone calls. Did you blow up on the student or did you, again, just like very quietly and privately just like said like, Hey, don't do that again. I, I didn't like that. Like that was very disrespectful, whatever the, whatever it was, but they're going to watch and they're going to wait and they're going to almost hold their breath because like you'll see in that moment, the classroom is going to kind of grind, not grind to a halt, but it's going to steadily slow down and all eyes are going to be on you and that student and they're going to wait. What are you going to do? And this is going to set the stage, honestly, for how students will view you. The students that you were kind of struggling with to develop a relationship, it's going to push them away if you don't act in a consistent manner. Your favorite student, it's going to set the stage for that relationship as well, too. What it's going to show them is, can I get away with things? 
And then to one extent, it's actually going to fracture that relationship simply because then they're going to start to take advantage of you. And it's not that they're doing it because they're malicious or, or, or evil or, or anything like that. They're doing it simply because they are a self-interested individual. I mean, we, we all act out more or less out of self-interest and they're going to do it because they're going to be like, I, I can get away with this. Why not do it? Not every kid, but a lot of kids will. So be consistent through and through, even when it hurts, even when it's difficult. Be consistent because in the end, your classroom culture will be stronger. For sure, it will be stronger because kids will know what to expect at every turn. But also because you're helping develop your kids into well-functioning adults by being consistent because you're giving them exactly what they're looking for, exactly what they crave and exactly what they need. So the, the things that I just discussed, having empathy, being authentic, being respectful, being consistent. This is obviously not a very exhaustive list. It, it doesn't cover everything that you need to do to build strong relationships with your kids. It's very truncated. But the thing is, is that this is a very strong starting point. Like these were the things that it took me a while to really click and to really, really resonate and recognize that it's like, ah, I need to be doing these things. It took me too long to a certain extent. But this is something like we're going to we're going to come back to this obviously in future episodes we're going to dive in a little bit deeper we will maybe even explore these four topics but we're going to circle back to this point and round this list out now again there are some very simple tips like avoid sarcasm um never i i give this advice to as many teachers as I can. Do not be sarcastic with your kids because you never truly know how a student is going to take it. They may seem to take it and laugh it off, but you could hurt that really. You, they could be really hurting inside because you said something that really deeply offended them. They're just too afraid to actually say something about it. So just straight up avoid sarcasm with kids. It doesn't work as well as you think. It doesn't build as strong relationships as you think it will build. If anything, it can do way more harm. Um, but let let these things just kind of settle in your mind. Let it marinate and slowly become that extension of your practice. And truthfully, you're like if Captain Cisco can unify his team, you can unify your students. So a little bit of homework. We know, again, like I, I want to give you that action step. I want to give you that clear next point. So if you're currently teaching remotely because of COVID, again, I got to recognize the circumstances that we are in right now. Building relationships is a touch more difficult. But what I've been able to see and practice myself is that it is still possible. A lot of the practices that you use in the physical classroom can still work in the virtual one if you are live teaching. So keep that in mind. Don't think that all hope is lost just because you're online. So in terms of building relationships, whether you're teaching remotely or in person, your homework is I want you to first think about the students that tend to fly under the radar. Now, you may know exactly a student may have come to your mind like these are not the all stars that every teacher loves. And these are not those like extra love required kids that everyone in the building knows. These are the ones that tend to get about average grades. They don't ever really get in trouble. And sometimes you honestly forget to call their names because uh, for attendance because you typically assume that they're just there. Think of those kids. And I want you to choose just one. Focus on that one student for the next week and utilize a bit of what we've talked about today to begin to strengthen your relationship with them. So again, have empathy, like seek them out. Ask them how they're doing. Ask them what they're interested. Be authentically you. Honestly, be real with your, be real with that. And then be consistent. Don't just like try this out as like the, this one week homework assignment and just drop. It. It's like be consistent. Take that interest in that student. Learn about who they are. Because I firmly believe and I know just from my own practice that you are going to develop that relationship with them and you're going to start to see that student blossom. A bit more in your class. You're going to start to see them push themselves a little bit more just simply because you took the time to develop that relationship. 
So be sure to follow and like us on Facebook at Morning Prep Pod. If you have a question or an episode topic that you want to suggest, please send me an email at morningpreppod at gmail.com. We're also on YouTube, uh, just posting the posting this exact audio on YouTube as well. So check those places. Again, follow us, subscribe on YouTube, follow and like us on Facebook, um, whatever podcasting platform that you're using to listen to this. Again, follow us on there. Please share this with your friends, with your other kids teach your friends. Um, again, like there's still tips and advice in here, just generally for just for helping you to be a better person, share this with your friends as well, if you so desire. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I look forward to again, hearing from you all. I look forward to again, growing this platform and just helping everybody's practice become that much stronger. This was the morning prep podcast. The bell is about to ring. So I will see you in the classroom. Thank you.